Through the history of humanity, we have been fascinated by our skies. Across different civilizations, we have followed the motion of the stars, the planets, their moons, and much, much more. All of these inquiries have revealed a wealth of information about the workings of our universe and our place in it. As cosmologists, we study the whole history of the universe, right from the Big Bang to the way we see it today. This is an image of the night sky taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. On the one hand, simply by looking at the fraction of this image that is black, it may appear that much of our universe is in fact empty with vast expansive voids, full of nothingness. On the other hand, we also realize that we as humans are living in a very special place in the universe, a place where there is an excess of material structure, an overabundance of stuff compared to the rest of the universe. Almost every bright point in this image is a galaxy, or even a cluster of galaxies. And you and I, we live on a planet in one particular galaxy in this multitude. In this unique location of the universe, that is not in fact empty and has gathered matter into this relatively localized region of a small galaxy. Some of the main questions that I study aims to answer how these structures came into being. From this map of the universe as we see it today, I try to understand its evolution through time. To delve deeper, we need to take a step back and consider that while every bright point in that previous image was a galaxy, illuminated by millions of stars and gas, over the last century or so, we have actually come to understand that the sum of all the luminous matter in the universe, that is all the matter that can emit light or absorb light, is actually a very small fraction of the total matter budget of the universe. In fact, luminous material contributes a mere 15% of the total mass in the universe. The rest of all the matter is actually dark. As far as we know, it does not emit or absorb any light at all. Not in the visible spectra through which we see. We cannot see it in X-rays or infrared or any other part of the electromagnetic spectrum that we know and love. This invisible matter is what we now know as dark matter. So we cannot see dark matter. How then did scientists come to infer its existence in the first place? The story of dark matter is much like finding footsteps in the sand. Dark matter, like everything else in the universe which has mass and you can weigh, exerts a gravitational force. Gravity is also the only known force that can act over large astronomical distances between stars that are separated by light years, or galaxies that are even further apart. Physicists actually inferred the presence of dark matter through its gravitational signature on the stuff that we can see. A good analogy actually comes if you do a simple thought experiment by thinking what happens if we could not see the moon, if we turned it off one day, say it absorbed all the light of the sun and did not reflect any, and we could not see it. Would we still be able to infer that it's there? The answer, of course, is yes. We'd study the rising and ebbing of the tides in our oceans, and eventually, over time, we'd come to infer that we have a massive neighbor orbiting around us, exerting a gravitational pull on our vast malleable seas. In a similar way, the earliest hints of dark matter came through its gravitational signature on the motion of galaxies in a cluster. As early as 1930s, Scientists were trying to explain the high velocities of the galaxies in the Coma Cluster. The Coma Cluster is a nearby system of bound galaxies. This means that the galaxies in the cluster move in a choreographed fashion, orbiting each other, bound together by some overarching force. Since gravity is the only force that can act over such, such large distances, scientists knew that the motion of the galaxies in the cluster had to be explained by the total mass, total gravitating mass in the system. But despite adding up all the mass that was there in the luminous galaxies, they could not explain the fast velocities of these galaxies. In fact, it appeared that you needed a lot more mass to actually hold the system together in the first place, to bind the system together. It seemed as if there needed to be an overarching spherical distribution of mass that was not present only in the luminous galaxies. The most definitive or final evidence for the existence of dark matter actually came much later, around the 1970s, from the work of Vera Rubin. 
She was a pioneering American scientist working with her colleague Kent Ford, and they were trying to study the motion of the stars in the disk of the Andromeda galaxy. They were trying to learn how fast different parts of the disk was rotating. What they expected to see was what we see on the left of this image. The disk should slow down as they went far out from the center. But what they found instead was it was more like the image on the right. The stars in the outer parts of the disk were actually moving way too fast, as if their motion was dictated by a much more massive overarching gravitational field of a spherical halo of matter around it. This mass, this gravitational potential, could not be associated with any bright visible matter, and yet it had a strong influence on the rotation of the disks. Almost at around the same time, two other scientists, Ostriker and Peebles, found that one could not even form these disk-like galaxies in the first place if it wasn't for a spher spherical halo of mass around it. These disks would disintegrate away if, if the only mass in the system was that associated with the light in the galaxies. Therefore, the very existence of thin disk galaxies challenged the picture of the universe as we knew it at that time, pointing to the necessity of invoking some form of matter that was visible gravitationally, but invisible in light. These revolutionary results urged scientists to start thinking out of the box and eventually accept the mounting evidence for a new kind of matter that was visible only through its gravity. So by the late 1970s, early 1980s, dark matter detectives were out there trying to investigate the nature and behavior of this very mysterious component of the universe. All galaxies, from the dimmest ones to the brightest ones, we now began to understand were actually formed inside of dark matter halos. These massive dark matter halos provided a sort of a gravitational well, which drew in other mass, becoming fertile regions of the universe where everything formed, stars, quasars, galaxies, every light thing that you can think of. Not only did dark matter bend and pave the movement of galaxies, scientists also knew that by virtue of its gravity, a clump of dark matter could also bend the path of light itself. This prediction comes from Einstein's theory of general relativity. For example, in this image, a large cluster of galaxies that is embedded in a massive dark matter halo acts like a cosmic lens bending the light from galaxies that are behind it, making them look like distorted arcs. This phenomenon, which is known as gravitational lensing, along with measuring the motion of galaxies, is today one of the primary ways in which we infer the total mass of dark matter in dark matter halos and also generally in the universe. The evolution of the universe is actually a very delicate balance between two fundamental components, dark matter, and dark energy. Along with learning about dark matter, over the last decade, we have also learned that our universe is expanding at an ever increasing speed. Today, we think that this expansion is driven largely by an unknown form of energy that we call dark energy. Together, dark matter and dark energy are responsible for the observed state of the universe today. This movie is a computer simulation of, the of a volume of the universe. The color traces the dark matter density. At early times, we begin with a largely uniform distribution of dark matter everywhere, but we have small fluctuations of density from place to place. With time, as the overall universe expands because of dark energy, the regions that have slightly more dark matter than average slow down detach from the overall expansion, become unstable and collapse gravitationally, forming filaments and sheets and dark matter halos, and this web and network of dark matter throughout the universe. Just how these structures form, just how fast they form, and how much of it forms dep depends intimately on the exact amount of dark matter and dark energy that there is in the universe. In regions where dark matter clumps up and comes together, galaxies are born. The galaxies that we see are therefore embedded in an underlying web of dark matter. The number of galaxies, its abundance and clustering, therefore tells us about the underlying dark matter that it's lying on. And knowing and inherently knows about the energy that was there in different components of the universe at the beginning. The web of galaxies therefore holds a light to the web of dark matter behind it.
Apart from knowing how much dark matter there is in the universe, we also want to know what it is. Is it a particle? Is it a fluid? Does it interact in any other ways apart from gravity? What, for example, is the mass of the dark matter particle? One way I try to understand the properties of dark matter is by studying the dark matter halos very closely. Halos form at the knots of the cosmic web. These are regions with the highest density of dark matter in the universe where it has come together gravitationally forming a clump of matter. By understanding the properties of the, of the halo, like its shape, its size, or where its boundaries are, we can start to probe the detailed microphysical properties of dark matter. By and large, we currently think that most of the observations in the universe are well explained by dark matter being heavy particles that only interact gravitationally and are largely slow moving with little or no random or dispersive velocities at all. We call this basic picture the cold dark matter paradigm. Cold because of its heavy and calm temperament or kinetic properties. This coldness has very important implications for the structure of dark matter halos. In fact, it has deep implications for the kind of halos that we see in the universe. If dark matter is massive, cold and slow moving, even the smallest perturbations or the weakest gravitational wells will make dark matter collapse and form tiny small halos. In fact, in the cold dark matter scenario, we expect to find halos that are as small as the Earth's mass. But if dark matter had random velocity, velocities, if it was a light particle, these random velocities would help dark matter escape out of the weakest gravitational potential, forming only the ma more massive dark matter halos, but not the tiny ones. In the cold dark matter scenario, we think halo formation is hierarchical. The low mass halos form first, merging together to form larger massive halos. So within any one massive halo in the cold dark matter picture, we expect to see many more smaller substructures, like the halo in the top panel shown over here. On the other hand, in the warmer scenario, if dark matter is a light, warm particle, we see a much smoother distribution of matter without the small clumps of matter within a larger halo. One of the ways to understand the nature of dark matter particles is to therefore look for these small clumps in the universe, to go after the signatures of the smallest of halos. Powerful telescopes are now looking for these low mass objects. We look for them in clusters of galaxies and in the halo of our own Milky Way, hoping to find not only the dimmest galaxies that live in these halos, but also the gravitational signatures of the tiniest of halos that never light up through its impact, for example, on the tidal streams of the Milky Way. This today is an exciting avenue to search for the properties of dark matter. Our body of knowledge about the physical universe increases by leaps and bounds, hand in hand with technology at every single stage. Right from the very first telescope that Galileo made, revealing the moons of Jupiter and heretically suggesting that we are not in fact the center of the universe, to the gravitational wave detector, which was made for the LIGO experiment that can detect the distortions in the very fabric of space-time from the merging of black holes. The experiments that are planned for the next decade will allow us to learn about dark matter and dark energy with great precision. The Vera Rubin Observatory, for example, plans to map almost half of the entire observed sky. This large experiment, which actually brings together scientists from all over the world, will not only provide us with a huge sample of galaxies that will give us extremely good statistics, it will also probe ever fainter galaxies, galaxies that are much fainter than have been looked at with experiments such as these before. This was these faint galaxies will help us see further out in space, more distant in space, and also find the very low mass halos in nearby galaxies like our own Milky Way. At the same time, um, along with the VRO experiment, we also have the James Webb Telescope, which will open a window to the time in the universe when the first stars and galaxies were forming, revealing an exciting and so far observationally relatively unexplored epoch in the universe. We have come a long way to understand the composition of the universe. 
Astrophysical probes of dark matter are some of the most promising directions to learn about the material that makes up most of our universe. While dark matter may seem abstract, science is replete with stories of paradigm shifting discoveries such as these. Just like the discovery of neutrinos or the discovery of genes, dark matter was in fact conspicuous in its apparent absence. Today, while there is obviously a lot left to learn, we also do think that we already know a lot about dark matter. We already know a lot about our universe and we know it quite precisely with the help of wonderful physicists, powerful computers and path-breaking technology-making telescopes. And yet, as always, at this exciting juncture for cosmology, the more we learn, the more questions we uncover. And we look at ourselves and hope to look at ourselves and our universe from ever-changing new perspectives.